Maybe. GM Farcaster. It is Tuesday, April 16th, and you are here with Nounish Prop and Adrian and a very special guest, July. And I'm so excited to have you here. Hi, July. Welcome. Say hello Thanks to the people. Thanks for having me. And he looks nothing like his profile pic. Uh, this is usually the thing that you hear from everyone, um, is that you do not look like a statue of a, a Roman god. Um, <laughs> so there, now, now you all know. Now you all know. It's wonderful to have you here. Um, Adrian, wonderful to have you back. Uh, yesterday we had not Adrian, which you ended up buying Toady Hawk, not Adrian.eth. And I think that is just hilarious. So I don't know you're, what you're, I don't know what he's going to do with it, but I can't wait to see. It, and I'm also a little scared for you, but we'll see what happens. Um. <laughs> I ate my dog. I ate my dog food yesterday. I listened as a I listened to the recording, and I got caught up on the news of the day. It was great. There you go. This is what we're here for. Um, so speaking of, we are going to start with a little bit of news, and then we're going to jump into just chatting with July because there's so much to talk about. Um, so we have from Dan, we have officially, uh, everything is back up and running. And I did think this was a great message from him on uptime and app performance. We're greater than 20 X the usage since the beginning of the year. So naturally we're running into all the parts of the system that need to be scaled and rethought. This is both a Warpcast and Farcaster protocol challenge. Appreciate everyone's understanding and patience. And then below that. We're only 14 people, so hiring a few more staff and engineers will help. Do you know of any staff engineers with experience at scaled uh, scaled consumer tech startups have them reach out? And this was related to mostly images being down. So we had a lot of memes going along with this, and some of them were quite creative. So image uploads are working again. But before that, we had people getting very creative with sharing images <laughs> like this, like very interesting. That's, impress text. That's impressive. Isn't that impressive? That was pretty impressive. I got to say, uh, very impressive. And then this from uh, Sartoshi, images are down, but it can't stop us. And basically it's just a description of the uh, parents in their thirties, young couple, PNG. Text, honey, we saved enough for a house. Let's have kids. Uh, and then burnt outrage guy. Text, was that the dip? Um, so that was his meme in text form. And then they all came back. Uh, I want you to put the word out there that images are back from Bitflow's ghost. And we had this one with the really fun raccoon, me celebrating that I can post images again. This is what you choose to start with. Okay. And then this was my favorite. I've never from... seen the raccoon before. <laughs> you haven't seen the raccoon? Oh, the raccoon's no. everywhere. I'm oh, that raccoon's everywhere. Enough, apparently. You got to go hang out in memes more. Uh, and this was from Johnny as well, nonlinear, uh, failed to upload image file size may be too large, which I thought this was quite creative. Um, so you all probably remember a time when there were no images on Farcaster, because <laughs> I do. So it's like, you know, just going back to the olden days. That's Wait, I was. literally don't. I remember no video. Remember no video. But there was a time. There I was don't no remember no game. No images, and I know I was here for it, but yeah, you just for forgotten. You were definitely mm -hmm. here for it. There was no images for a little bit there. It's like um, how I don't have like you don't have memories when you're four years old. <laughs> like you remember one thing. It's like my brain wasn't developed back. In you only day. remember the pictures of the things that happened. <laughs> exactly. Um, did it change your behavior at all? Not having images that you were able to post, or did it like make a difference that much to you? Either um, one of you. I'm just curious. Well, I'll, I'll go. I'll go first. So it, that combined with um, the notification updates. Mm. So the the notifications have changed, where they're kind of showing priority and hiding things. You're not getting the the little red dot every time you get a like. Mm. Um, so I said the 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 algorithm change to the dopamine casino might might mean I'm not coming back to check. Um, I was also playing with shiny new object air chat over the weekend. So, uh -huh. and I was also traveling and I was away with my daughter for the weekend. So my behavior was changed over the weekend. Is it because I couldn't post images? Probably not. Probably not. Yeah. Air chat was interest has been interesting. I, I, of course, you know, I had, it had my interest for a good 24 hours and now I've waned. Um, and July, I saw you on there as well, but I don't think you've, 
Have you actually put any voice messages on air chat yet? Yeah, I did. I was oh, um, did. Okay. curious to, to play around with it. And I, I think I ca I posted something. I almost said casted. <laughs> I, think I posted something on there. <laughs> yeah, I did. I was uh, curious about it as well. And I tried it out. Um, mostly just read a poem. Oh, I have to go back in because I literally yeah. posted in our discord. Uh, Adrian and I have a discord where we share links and stuff for the show. And I put, I saw your, your, you were in there and I went waiting because <laughs> there was nothing yeah. underneath yet. I'm like, waiting, yeah. waiting. What's he going to say cool. first? <laughs> you know, um, yeah, uh, I'm not really, um, I haven't spent too much time on air chat either to, to say this or that. I don't think my behavior also changed too much with images. Um, you're pretty text based anyways. It seems like you're usually you're usually doing a lot of writing in casts and not really um I'm not seeing a ton of images from you generally speaking anyway. So, although this one was yours, so I I did use it as my it's background. True. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> so I was trying to pull a good one for the background. Um so any, I, I think, you know, I think there was a lot of folks who were thrown off by images, images not being available, like really thrown off. And especially in the memes and reply guy channels, um, they did not know what to do, the, do with themselves. But uh, I think it was kind of, you know, it didn't, it didn't impact me too much. Occasionally it was like, oh, that's right. I can't share that yet. Um, but mostly I, I would just share links to our mints and that worked just fine. So it would show the image within the frame. So that was, yeah, that works was fine. Maybe, yeah, maybe it was a planned outage that forces you to go mint things and share the mint link. So we're going to blame Zora. It's all Zora. Mm -hmm. Jacob, it's, it's a, it's a conspiracy theory. Now we have a conspiracy theory. Uh, that's Not a funny. conspiracy if it's true. <laughs> <laughs> Don't start. This is how it starts. <laughs> this is how it starts. Here's how we start. Uh, Come to GM Farcaster for all your fake news. <laughs> all your fake news. We've got a bunch of other things for tomorrow that we'll be sharing because we will be back on tomorrow morning. So I'm going to save the rest for then. Um, and I want to focus on our guest today because there's a lot to talk about. And um, so July, let's start with, can you give a little bit of your background? And then I want to dive into Faust because that is really fascinating to me. Um, so tell us a little bit about like, how did you end up in crypto? What did you do before? And, and what are you doing now? Or are you even in crypto? You really, are you, hmm. How did you end yeah. up on Farcaster? Good, I guess is question. my question. Yeah. Yeah. So my background is originally more in robotics. I've worked on autonomous vehicles and uh, autonomous, uh, self-driving cars and a few other things. Uh, was at Kitty Hawk building uh, flying cars with Larry Page uh, for about half a decade. Uh, that was till about, uh, I think, yeah, I think we had, it was at Kitty Hawk, which had a lot of different projects, um, different vehicles at the time. Um, yeah, it came much more from this sort of robotics background. How I got into crypto, uh, I've just had an interest in things that are new, um, keeping more from. Well, obviously, if you have an interest in flying cars, you're, cars, you're definitely interested in things that are new. <laughs> like, yeah. It's so uh, amazing. It's, you know, whatever the, the sort of interesting new futures that might be, those are something that was always of interest to me. Distributed systems and more interest in cryptography. Uh, led me more towards crypto. I had friends mining Bitcoin probably back in 2012 or 2013. I just didn't quite, it didn't quite click for me. I think when Ethereum came along and I read the, the paper for sort of more world computer and distributed system, that was really difficult to take down. It sort of started, oh, it's like you can actually run computation on it and started to click. Um, yeah, over time, just relatively sold on the, the sort of, oh, this is probably going to be a thing and it's going to last for a long time. I just don't know when it's going to happen. So just kind of stuck around, but was mostly in 
in sort of robotics. And um, yeah, I think thinking of it more as uh, this is sort of this like new market that's going to open up and be an opportunity to do something in. And so sort of just been kept keeping an eye on it. Um, yeah, I could probably talk about Kitty Hawk the rest of the show if that's <laughs> sort of what you want as well. There's sort of a so lot of things to unpack there. Um, we did over, I think, 25,000 flights. A uh, bunch of them were, wow. were crewed with people as well. Um, I flew a bunch myself. The Can we talk about that? Of, yeah, I think we need yeah, to pause Yeah, what would you like moment. to know, I guess? Like, yeah. Yeah. like what's just, it like to fly I don't a meet car? <laughs> yeah, I just don't meet that many people who have said they've flown a car. You are literally George Jetson sitting in front of us, and this is fascinating to me. Um, yeah, what is that? One of the how ways... is it different from a plane? Like, how is it different from a small, you know, what's the difference? Yeah, there? The, one of the main differences is that, I mean, it, you know, I think there, there are a bunch of different vehicles at Kitty Hawk. I was part of a program called Flyer. The program specifically that um, had a, you, you sort of think of it almost like a very, very large, if you Google Kitty Hawk Flyer, You'll get some search results. The and there, there's pictures and videos as well. The sort of like a very large drone with a person in it. Um, there were specific ways that um, build, building an, an aircraft is. There's a lot of different ways to go about it, and uh, there are sort of much much longer ways to get certification, and there are shorter ways to make more kind of experimental aircraft. Um, I think we went the very, very experimental route in can we build and iterate and ship an aircraft relatively quickly. Uh, the other sort of longer route is getting sort of certification. There's a program called the DO-178C that you get certified to kind of create and then get a vehicle and test it and it's a much longer process. So can you do something relatively quick? And that was kind of the, the thesis, I think. So I know it wrapped up and didn't didn't yep. move forward. Um, what do you think the likelihood is that we'll see actual, you know, commercial flying cars, like something that we can go to a dealer and buy ourselves in our lifetimes? Yeah, I think it'll happen. I think, well, yes and no. I don't think it, okay. it will happen in the way that we think it'll happen, but I think it'll happen. I think, uh, yeah, maybe more, I don't think people will go and buy their flying cars maybe, but I think there will be services that are available, mm. you know, akin to Waymo perhaps that allow for mm. different versions of it. Urban air mobility is oh. a market that I think is still going to take some time to grow as well. So we'll see, okay. uh, definitely possible. It's, it's, uh, some of it's not just a technology problem. I think it's a business and politics problem. Oh, I mean, that's interesting. Even, yeah, but just even things like autonomous driving, which is a lot more skeuomorphic mm -hmm. to what we know, which is, you know, driving is mm -hmm. largely politics and um, kind of social problems. So I can't even imagine, mm -hmm. like, you have to get the physics of flying cars but then to think about adoption of like, oh, this is in your life and you can use it, seems like massive yeah, endeavor. I think you look at something like general magic from the 80s and it's not that building an iPhone wasn't possible in the 1980s. It just didn't make economic sense to do so. And I think a lot of it today comes down more to it doesn't really make economic sense to build a not very capable vehicle that can ferry people across sort of short distances because we don't have power density and batteries plus the cost of building. You know, there, there's sort of no business model that quite makes sense. So I don't think it's an issue. Yeah, it's more of a market issue. Technology is slightly of an issue, uh, but you know, these are things that will just improve and we'll get there. So I, I almost have no doubt that it'll happen. It's just more a matter of time. Reminds me of like some of the urban areas that have the helipads and things like that. It seems like it could be similar to that, but 
maybe used it depending on, and I have no idea what the cost is on that. Um, but it seems like it could be something that eventually could be cost efficient and used in that way where you're going across something like New York, where you're trying to get from one side to the other that could take forever, you know, on a busy, in a busy moment and just, you know, skipping over. Um, but it sounds like it probably is in our life, at least in my lifetime, maybe not in yours, um, is going to be a luxury. If it happens, it'll be a very high end luxury type of thing. I would think. So I think that was the initial, you know, you nailed the head on, I think some of the initial use cases that we went after. Yeah. Luxury market, bearing people across areas that don't make sense to build infrastructure. Um, were, were definitely considerations. And yeah, the, there's different types of vehicles as well that are autonomous and you can fly with. So shorter distance vehicles um, that are more drone-like versus mm. fixed wing aircraft have more aerodynamics on your side. So you get more fuel efficiency or you get longer battery life essentially. And they're all electric powered. Well, these ones were all electric powered. So you can also get a hybrid engine uh, that will last you a lot longer but it starts to use gas or it uses mm -hmm. uh, gasoline. So it adds another element. Uh, oh, what power? Yes. Yeah. What was yeah, the Katie power was, The kind of thesis was, hey, we're going to use electric. Can we do this mm -hmm. with electric only? And that so, simplified things, but also made it a lot harder. Weight, hmm. weight limit? What was the weight limit? Oh, good question. The, for the, Flyer program, I think it was 250 pounds. Uh, if you're under 250 pounds, you qualify for ultralight aircraft. And if you have ultralight aircraft, you don't need certification. And hmm. uh, it's like experimental aircraft, technically. So if you look up ultralight aircraft, you'll see the kind of vehicles that it's the, it's like the type of vehicles with the most number of accidents. <laughs> also, also not I a guess. good thing <laughs> not good for yeah, branding uh, at all <laughs> the well, marketing it's, it's, yeah. it's you're probably good, gonna it's, die it's, uh, but it's gonna be really fun <laughs> like, yeah. did you guys see three body problem yes yeah have you i have that read the book but i haven't i haven't watched the the uh the show yet okay i read did the book and i can't remember if this <laughs> what you didn't know it was a book i didn't even know it was a book <laughs> That's, this is perfect. Actually, this is perfect triangle right here. Only read the book, only saw the movie, read the book, saw the, movie, you know, yeah. saw the show. But I forget perfect. the book and I don't want to give away spoilers um, for the show and I can't remember, but I'll say this mm. to Prof because you know, there was like the, the one consideration of what gets sent into space. Yeah. in towards the later yeah. episodes of yeah. like really making sure you're uh, yeah. optimizing for weight. <laughs> And After no spoilers, and, watch the show. And also, yeah, and also you may not, you're not coming back. Yeah, it's official. <laughs> uh, if you this come back, you're not coming back in your regular form, that's for yeah. sure. Um, this is such an interesting conversation because I, talking to you, July, I, I'm getting the sense that you hang out with people um, who also recognize that flying cars exist. So for the rest of the world, we had we have no idea it's possible. We think it's a physics problem. We think like we're told it's kind of a, it's, it's not going to happen because it can't happen. Um, and, uh, you know, we've all heard the, you know, the saying we were promised flying cars, cars, and all we got were 180 characters. And <laughs> I'm sure you get that all the time. What's a, uh, and we're talking to someone who's flown in a car. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> but where's my, yeah, it's, <laughs> it's sort of like, um, it's, I think it's terrifying in some ways. I think it's initially terrifying because you don't know what to expect. Um, and then I think the second part is it's terrifying, or at least our vehicle was terrifying in the sense that you just get so used to it so quickly. It's like hmm. operating a jet ski or something and you don't realize. Really? That's interesting. Uh, how so why would that be terrifying? I would think that would be exhilarating. Maybe we just, you know, knew how duct tape the code was. So it was, uh. you're flying in this thing and it's so smooth. And, uh, well, no, I wouldn't say it's just <laughs> duct tape, but, you know, it's, it's sort of like, this is just a bunch of code. In some way. Wild. You know what goes Our, into it. We do right, have to see how the sausage is made. Yeah, exactly. I think it's, yeah. You don't want to eat it sometimes. Well, I do want to shift pretend. a little bit to what your your new project is, though which is kind of 
related to this. And I'd love for you to tell us about rock and what is rock and what you're working on now, because yeah, that is so fascinating as well. And that's kind of bringing together your background with everything that's ha happening currently in technology. Yeah, I think, you know, fundamentally, um, I see Faust as a robotics company. We're, we're pri primarily, I think, 80 to 90, you know, 80-ish, 90-ish percent of the team is, uh, most of the team is ex Kitty Hawk, uh, sort of my former colleagues, ex Tesla, ex Apple SBG, the uh, special projects group, the self-driving car program. Um, so yeah, and we're mostly based in SF Bay Area. And yeah, I mean, just from the team makeup and kind of what we're sort of long-term focused on, I'd, I'd say we're, we're robotics focused. Um, again, kind of coming at it from this perspective that we think it's an interesting opportunity to build for an interesting new market in crypto. And starting in that way, that allows us to, you know, sort of what can we do when, um, yeah, we start with crypto. And I think there's a lot of interesting things that if anything, hardware companies and folks that want to build new kinds of hardware are uh, just sort of think that it's a smaller market and, and sort of not worth pursuing. And we think it's worth pursuing and building sort of real things in. Um, and so sort of in a way that allows us to, to start there. So that's, that's kind of the, the sort of background, but um, yeah, we're building rock rock is going to be uh, sort of our first device. Again, we kind of left it a little bit uh, vague. I think here we, we do have more already sort of planned and, and if anything, uh, we're, we're working on more than kind of meets the eye. Uh, but fundamentally, it's, you know, we, we think of it as a way that we can use to notarize sort of reality. The use case being that folks that are building on uh, EVM compatible platforms are, don't want to build their own hardware and, you know, have a difficult time being able to do stuff in the real world today uh, that use sort of sensors. And we can provide a way to close that gap between sort of the real world and, and what they're doing already on chain. And there's an opportunity to sort of start there. Um, but yeah, fundamentally in, in the sort of long run, we, we, we sort of see more of a future where we're building more and more robotics. Uh, Cause that's honestly where we're coming from. So in a way, um, don't know how to describe it other than sort of thinking of rock more as a, as a robot head that we can kind of start off of that we're adding it's you know it has cameras and it has things but really to be able to to sort of do more things autonomously is, is kind of what we what we're thinking in the long run i love the, the framing run. of notarizing reality i think that you know we've heard attestations before which is very different from you know what you're talking about but i haven't heard it put in the terms of notarizing and i think I think my legal brain found that very interesting. So that's my background. So it was just kind of, oh, that's, hmm. Hadn't thought about it like that. Um, can you give an example of how this might work or how it will work? And so we kind of have an idea of a use case for this. Yeah, I think the, the first thing is, um, you know, how, how, one of the things, you know, what's different from maybe maybe one way to explain this sort of what's different from saying making like a attestation already uh you know kind of using eas like ethereum attestation service or or sort of other things the difference is this is more sort of taking in you know we're, we're building the hardware that allows for people to be able to make the proof more on the hardware side uh, so it kind of sits more on the actual device. And so when you're taking in sensor data, we can kind of create proofs, or we can allow software developers to create proofs for their programs. So we kind of provide the, the infrastructure to do that and make those attestations, your sensor attestations locally. And then you can send those attestations to some location. Right now, you know, we, one of the things is, 
we're using phones and computers as interfaces for everything that's sort of in Web3. And there's no sort of alternative way to start putting in information into the, there's no hardware designed for sort of the on-chain world. And so what we see is if we can kind of provide those, it starts to unlock the use cases. Is that, and if I'm understanding July and tell me if I'm completely off base here, but yep. um, even with Farcaster, and with my messages being signed, when you get a cast from me and it's cryptographically signed, you know it's authentically coming yep. from me. But if I post a video, there's really no way to authorize that that video was actually happened. So I can take yep. a deep fake. Yes, it's me. It's authentic that I did it, but the video itself can't be, or an image can't be authentic. But if it's coming from the hardware of if I snap a photo and send it through, then it's kind of... Um, validating the authenticity of the actual photo. Yeah, you know, I think of it as like you could technically make a deep fake proof photo machine that's rock. Uh, that this this is the only machine in the world that can take photos on this specific Parkaster account. Uh, hmm. I think that's that's possible. Uh, in the longer run, when we have other sensors like GPS, it'll be possible to notarize not only the, the photo, but also the location data. And again, there's, there's sort of, I would, I would argue with something like uh, phone space, the, the folks over there, phone space, you know, they're working on a really cool problem where, you know, you're really trying to prove that you're somewhere specific and you, you, you're proving it without GNSS. Uh, or GPS. For, for us, we think of it as we don't, you know, our, our GPS might be spoofed, you know, 0.001% of the time, but we're just really kind of notarizing that GPS. If it's spoofed, it's spoofed. We're not going to be able to prove that. And that's okay. But it's sort of notarizing that sensor data alongside it. That's really so interesting. interesting. Like Aleph's um, trip to Kenya to verify yes. a goat. Bringing it back to Farcaster memes. Yep. That would have been that would have been a perfect use case. That would have been a everyone perfect said use we don't case. believe goat. So then he gets sent on a plane, and now no one believes him. <laughs> he went. There's like a whole bunch. Of, we were talking about like, that. Oh. Adrian's like, should I go to Kenya and make sure that he's there with the goat? <laughs> like, oh my god, it was really funny, and it was. But this would solve that completely. Yeah. Or and, and or the whole to... um. The whole discussion of uh, the moon landing, you know, there's a, there's a ton of conspiracy theory around the moon landing, whether or not it actually happened, and blah blah blah. So this, there you go, like this would, you know, send it up in space and say, "Yep, mm -hmm, I'm here, <laughs> here I am." So, yeah, I mean, you need a you need a sort of other proofs, other infrastructure that you would trust, you know. So, for example, if it's like GPS, you'd have to trust the GNSS. Um, right. The global navigation satellite system, and then GNSS is different in each country. So, if you are taking proofs in, say, like Russia, it's a little bit more difficult mm. to prove that you're. This is you know, there, there's sort of an area around um, certain areas in Russia where you know GPS turns off as well. So, it's harder to say exactly. And you know, again, but these are sort of edge cases. Most of the time, in, in most areas. GPS is going to get you most of the way there. And we do use it for even navigating vehicles. If combined with uh, inertial navigation system, GPS does pretty good, like centimeter accuracy. Hmm, really you can actually navigate vehicles with it, yeah. So, Really interesting. Um, there's a lot of talk. I hear a lot of folks say that hardware, like hardware is the hardest thing to, to jump into. And I, so... Do you ever have any concerns in that space? Like, I think you even mentioned before when we talked that um, you're like, I said I'd never do hardware again. <laughs> so what yeah. What keeps bringing you back to hardware? And how is it, um, how do you find that comparable to doing something else? Like, you know, just focusing strictly on software and things like that. Yeah, I think hardware is, is definitely a longer timeline compared to software. Um, the speed at which you can navigate with software 
generally speaking, um, unless you're sort of training models and doing sort of uh, more AI things, that takes a little longer for sure. Um, but I think hardware in general, it's a lot of moving parts. I would say it's multidisciplinary in the sense that depending on if you're doing sort of robotics, it's mechanical engineering, it's electrical engineering, it's systems engineering, it's software engineering, it's embedded systems, uh, it's robotic software, uh, robotic software, embedded systems and software, like general software engineering are all sort of different things. Um, yeah, there's sort of a lot of people and a lot of things that need to come together in order to get things done. Um, and if anything, I've, I've also been a part of a lot of different teams that have built hardware. And I think if anything, one of the ways that I think, you know, Faust is doing things differently is we're, we're sort of starting kind of piecemeal and, and growing the, the sort of complexity as we move forward um and trying to sort of ship the hardware cycles as fast as we can obviously uh but you know one of the ways to do it is to sort of build the whole robot first and ship that but that takes sort of potentially years and much longer um you know again if it's sort of a more industrial setting it's it's possible to kind of build things that are going to be usable quickly but you know we, we almost thought of it as can we do sort of smaller pieces and, and kind of build on that instead of trying to do everything all at once. So we're trying to take a little bit of a different approach. Adrian, that looked like you had a question. I saw you writing things down. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, shifting it to you. Anything. <laughs> I'm shifting it to you. Um, Relatively open book. book. I'll tell That's you what I wrote down. I don't have questions. I saw you making notes. notes. <laughs> yeah. Well, it's just, it's you're, we're starting to see some really good hardware companies. And I think it's funny because it's, yeah, inherently you can't do hardware like you do software, but I think some of these um, companies are trying to kind of take that software approach yep. um, as, as much as possible. No, this is what I wrote down in quotes. I said I'd never do hardware again. A, a great quote by a hardware founder. <laughs> I'm going to. Yeah, I mean. I also, it's funny. It's, uh, and I've heard that from so many, like, I've, I've heard that like floating around at different, different folks saying similar things too. So I think it's really interesting that you kind of still end up back there. Cause obviously that's gotta be somewhere in your passion or in your DNA or something that keeps driving you back to, to that. I, I, I think like physically moving things are just the, you know, robotics in general and hardware in general is something that I just really excited and interested in doing. And um, also, you know, I, I think one of the things that, you know, or one of the sort of different paths that we're taking is I also think, you know, crypto is just going to be this another technology that's available for people that unlocks new things. And the intersection of that is not something that you see. You don't see a lot of robotics people kind of thinking, oh, you know, crypto is yeah. the path forward or is a sort of market that we can start with. And uh, you also don't see a lot of crypto people kind of naturally having a ton of experience building robotics. And I think our team does. So that, I think that's one of our sort of unique paths that we're choosing to take, even though it kind of looks weird now for, for sort of some people that are maybe not in, not familiar with, with, uh, with crypto. We kind of think of it as a, is a excite is a place that they think there's opportunity. I love this. Uh, Michelin.eth is in our chat and said, uh, drops the quote, I don't invest in founders who are thinking about the future, but founders who are already living in the future. And I think that's like perfect. <laughs> it's a perfect description of you, really, <laughs> um, between flying cars and robots and and, uh, and blockchain all coming together. It's pretty cool. Um, yeah, there's good good comments in the chat today. Yeah. Oh, yeah. The chat's like yeah, popping off. By the way, the chat Rossi. also said... This was my favorite. So true. To be honest, we love our hosts, but the chat is always fire. In other words, you know, they're just here for the chat. <laughs> we're just, <laughs> we're just, you know, we're just window dressing. Um, so yeah, I love I this Rafi, uh, Rafi G in the chat. So, small little rocks gossiping about the state of reality is even more epic than flying cars. <laughs> There's the future. Yeah. There's the future. Um, I do have a few other questions that are unrelated to rock. So before I yeah, move forward, totally. um, 
Adrian, anything else on this topic before I dive into um, July on Farcaster, if you will? No, I'd love to go to July on Farcaster. Okay, sure, because because <laughs> that's a whole other a whole other thing. So I'm going to start with this meme because I think it sums it up perfectly. <laughs> July is like memes, but niche. Elaborate on that. No, <laughs> I thought that was just absolute perfection. And uh, I want to dive into this a little bit. Two things I've been thinking about. I'm the youngest that I'll ever be today in my entire life, reducing yourself to narratives alone, and you will become sophist. I feel like every time I read one of your casts, I need an hour to like do some research and then think about it. <laughs> so like you're a very deep thinker. So what that second part, what do you what did you mean by that? So that I don't have to spend as much time researching. Like what was that? What was the and what got you thinking about this? I guess is my other um, another question. Yeah, so I, I think the path that I got there was primarily because I was thinking about <clears throat> um yeah, like build, building things, you know, of course, I, I think mm -hmm. there's a sort of inherent relationship between, you know, your your strategy is uh, only as good as the communication that, that you can sort of bring to the table. So if you can't communicate your intent or if you can't communicate what you're trying to do in some way, uh, it's it's difficult to... You know, like you might, you, you might have a really great plan, but it, it might not even, you know, there's no sort of point in any of the plan or what you're doing to, to if you're not able to explain it. Um, but also just being able to explain it and explaining that you have a great plan, for example, is not, um, you know, a, a precursor to, or, you know, just a, a plan alone, like saying that you have this sort of a path for you know, being able, you, you can kind of be a charlatan. It's it's actually quite easy in a way, and uh, just kind of reminded me of of um, sophists and sophistry and and sort of classical antiquity. You know, mostly during the sort of Socrates time when or oration was the primarily primary way to communicate ideas. So people would train themselves in in the art of oration and, and what you know what is oration oration is a way to convince people of certain you know using rhetoric to using certain ways to convince a large audience of ideas even if and, and again off, 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 the office would be accused rightly so sometimes of just being you know this is like it's like learning how to be a charlatan learning how to be just doing sales almost so that alone almost kind of puts you in the sophist bucket. And if, you know, the, the, so what is the other side? Okay. Super interesting. Um, there's something else that you posted. This was actually a few couple weeks ago, but it yeah. caught my attention also um, that I'd love to dive into a little bit. If you live indefinitely, you'll eventually reach the heat death of the universe in order to live beyond that we will have to transgress the known existing universe. Perhaps that will happen between now and the end of this all. Two, friendships last a lifetime. Three, the act of creation lasts forever in that moment. And then you had, it, this was sort of taking off on uh, how long will things last? Websites, software, human-made objects, digital data, ge ge geological, biological, evolution of species, evolution of planet, evolution of solar system, galactic, death of sun, heat death of universe. Um, so that's a lot. But I thought this, the act of creation lasts forever in that moment. That to me was like what really jumped out. Um, what does that mean to you? Like what, what did, what was the thinking behind that particular statement? Because that to me just was like, huh, that made me think. It took me a minute. That was one of those, I'm going to need an hour just to digest this. <laughs> <laughs> I think I think I want to preface this with why, why I was thinking that to begin with. I think I was just thinking about like a lot of, you know, there, there's been popularity in like longevity and people throw mm -hmm. around this idea that, hey, we're going to live forever. And it's like, I don't think we understand 
what that means. Like we, we kind of toss mm. it in the same way that we toss around. Oh, everyone's going to buy this. But like, we don't really know what everyone means. Mm-hmm. Um, and so, so this what is a little mean? Brian Johnson. This is a little like pushback there on the longevity movement. Okay. Interesting. Well, I, I don't think it's a pushback a necessarily, but just what does Reality. that mean? Like what is, so if yeah. you want to live forever, what is, how long is that going to be? Is that, so what if you live till the end of the heat death of the universe? Are you going to, you know, is forever supposed to be longer than that? Or is, is it like, does it end there? Um, how long is, do you even want to live? You know, so, so to me, it just was more of, if, if anything was more of, I just started thinking about what that actually forever means um, and kind of started thinking about, are there places that we in some ways can live forever without having to live forever already? And uh, started thinking about how, yeah, there's different ways to create things. You know, for example, if you, who knows how long, um, you know, certain works of art will last, but still, uh, you know, for example, Vincent van Gogh paintings have lasted way beyond his lifetime and we can still, still continue to just sort of enjoy them and celebrate them. And most likely they'll, they'll last at least another hundred years. So just this idea that hundreds of years, these things are lasting much longer than us. So these things that people do in the moment, they still kind of last for much, much longer time than, you know, of course they're going to deteriorate, you know, and, and kind of become just a bunch of crumbling rocks and crumbling paint, but um, are there ways that last much longer than us? And sort of started thinking about that. So don't pretend to have the answer, just, just thoughts. I think it's Questions. interesting that so many, uh, who I would consider techno optimists are also deep studiers of history. I think there's some kind of connection there. And I think that's important because it's, you know, that saying of, you know, if we don't learn from history, we're doomed to repeat it kind of thing, but also you can learn so much and then, and also see, recognize those patterns and, and how that goes. But okay. That's a little different from what we were just talking about, but um, I've thought about that too, of like, do I want to live forever? I have no desire to do that like at all. Um, but I also find it very interesting of like, when you mentioned Van Gogh that during his life wasn't celebrated and didn't live to see that, um, appreciation of his work, but yet it outlives him and, and lives on. So, um, yeah, those are those, those things that we create that are going to outlast us. So in other words, Adrian, uh, GM Farcaster in some kind of uh, time capsule going to space somewhere. There we go. Maybe this episode and, <laughs> on the blockchain. And forever. I get reminded of a quote. There's a quote that I pulled from my parents' house. Like I took a picture of it and I keep casting it like every, I don't know, few months or so. But it was just about getting lost in the act of creation. And it was mm. kind of like create for the sake of creating and getting lost in it. And I think when we focus on kind of on the creative and, and and put your energies there and kind of divorce from the output is a really freeing place to be. So I kind of tie you. those. I don't know if that's where you were getting at with with the third point of that feeling of creation lasting forever. But yeah, I, I think I think I, I almost kind of think of it also as a way for you know you you can kind of make something. And in, in, in some way, if it's not not necessarily appreciated, but interacted with, interacted with it's not really. Uh, it kind of reminds me of a that movie that uh, Coco, the uh, the Pixar movie. Uh -huh. I don't know if you saw it, right? But it's sort of like if you if people don't remember you after yeah. you've passed away. And uh, that's when you sort of die the second time. The first time you die is when you physically die. And the second time you die is when no one remembers you anymore, essentially. And, and so, Coco has a focus a, around Day of the Dead and, and that sort of that yeah. whole tradition. And yeah. Big fan of the Pixar much. movies, by the way. I think they're yeah, same. just amazing. <laughs> um, the whole process of like me, how, how a lot of the Pixar movies, especially the early movies were made, are like really is a huge testament to collective group creation of something that's like really well made they're they're sort of obsessed with how to make really great movies and 
it takes a long time to make really great things. And I think that's, you know, or at least the, that path that they're sort of what they've committed to. So yeah. Total side note. Movies. There's a nouns movie that's coming out and a lot of the artists that are working on it used to work at Pixar. So it's, uh, it's uh, 3d, um, what's it? 3d pixel guy or 3d i forget what his name is 3d guy something like that and he's he's one of the artists on there and you can see some of his uh mini you know small little shorts that he's done you you can you feel the pixar vibes in it and it's really just amazing to see and they're doing it more from a collective perspective rather than the studio perspective and having it put more in the artist's hands. So it's going to be interesting to see how that all plays out in my mind it, in terms of like where we're going with um, different blockchain connections to that and the way in which we're doing creation more in the hands of the creator rather than in the hands of a producer who's sort of directing that um, ask those aspects. But uh, when does so that movie come out, Prof? I don't know. It's next. The next part of it should be coming out soon. Um, remember the movie, the the four three three four, the one for the um, yeah that dropped. Yeah, that's same yeah. same group of artists um, did that one as well, awesome. and that was really fun. Yeah. So total side note. Sorry, so, I got right. I got, so not, easy. got to throw nouns in there every once in a while. You know, can't help myself. It's not an episode without a noun drop. <laughs> we. Noun drop. <laughs> but I think it's like easy to make a TikTok, hard to make these long films mm -hmm. that really, you know, feel however, but even like the the best films that we're seeing today are forgotten in generations. Hmm. Interesting. So yeah. Very few very stand the test of time. And my favorite movie is from nineteen uh I don't know, forty one, something like that. So, you know, some of them do. Some of them some of them yeah, do I think the, sometimes the the some of the best kind of content is not um, independent of the time in which it's created. So I think a lot of really great films, or maybe it's also just the kind of how this works, but some of the best films I think were made in the sort of, you know, between the thirties and, and seventies, partially because that's when sort of film was starting to become and reach, you know, I, I think technologies and, and the sort of the medium, if the sort of, you know, the, the Marshall McLuhan medium is the message, Hmm. The, the the there's sort of seasons to the medians as well so there's sort of like a spring and, and a summer and autumn and, and and a winter to them and i think we're kind of in the the autumn of movies is sort of this certain sort of format of two hours and you know it used to be sort of like there was a constraint you had to work with a constraint now it's sort of this like infinite digital format and that's that's kind of changed the way that content is created so it's it, we can't go back to this way that medium content, you know, this, this sort of at a time when it was, mm. you know, mm. all you could do, you know, it was sort of pushing the boundaries of like human capacity to build two hour films. Um, yeah. Casablanca today would be a whole like 10 part mini series easily on yeah. Netflix. Yeah. It wouldn't mm -hmm. be, <laughs> it wouldn't be what it it's is. Different. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Totally so, different. And I wonder how that would change the, uh, I don't know some of the some of the things that are so great about it. So, but telling a story yeah. in a very different in a different way, um, where it almost feels like you're living those, you know, whatever it was, forty eight hours or whatever that you know time period, you know, very quickly. Uh, whereas that would be dragged out over you know numerous episodes. So it's yeah, very different storytelling. I don't know if it's. I think there's good and bad to that. You mentioned something else in there the me the you know the media the media is the message um which you got me down that rabbit hole again which i hadn't read that since i was in college um because you were reading something recently um around that if i can't remember what the name of the book was that you were reading though i think this medium um, is the message yeah was it that well, just that piece? essay yeah i thought you were reading Marshall a book though related to it was the same same author but oh the um, the television book yeah, yeah, that's what yeah. it was. That's also fascinating, by the way. Um, American broadcasters. Uh, that's what it was. Yeah, yeah, whole, that's what it was. Whole history I behind. Read. Yeah, we uh, need to dive into that more. <laughs> like that to me is really right now because of what we're of doing. College. I'm thinking about you know what we're doing right now, and I didn't you know this trajectory has been fairly recent. So thinking about what's changing about media and the way in which we 
um, communicate in the time of blockchain and um, also, again, putting things directly in creators' hands more than we've ever had and where it's not being controlled by sort of a studio boss or, or a, you know, a network CEO. Um, so it's kind of interesting to, to look back at that writing and see how prevalent and how relevant it is actually relevant today, more so than it even was when he wrote it back in the sixties and was talking about it in the seventies and eighties. So really interesting. Yeah. You need to go read that Adrian. That was it in re in the, for me, it was reliving it, but it's been a long time, been like 30 years since I read it. So, um, yeah, but it was really, it's really relevant to all of that today for sure. It's so, yeah, very interesting. Um, what were you going to say, Adrian? Sorry. I, guess I, I wasn't going to say anything. I will, I will read that. <laughs> I finally finished, I finally finished read, write own on the plane yesterday. Oh, good. And have a million yeah. other things, um, just about on chain media that I want to talk to you about someday. How have you read read, write own July? I'm I curious. have not. It's in my list of books. Um, yeah, I'd like to read it at some point. I also I'd love to get your takes on it books. too. I think that would be really, I'd love to hear your takes on yeah. that. Um, I think the basic part of it, which is really, I was thinking about this today, um, the computer versus the casino, sort of that basic thought premise. Today, we're talking about the computer. Last Tuesday, we were with the ASIC and it was all about the casino, but not really. Like there was a little bit of computer in there too, but it was kind of interesting yeah. to go with the, the DGEN into to this. And it leads me to something else. From that DJs to flying cars. <laughs> and we do it all. We do it all. Um, let me see if I can find it now. You were talking about spam. Are we coming up on time soon? Oh, by we're the way? so coming we up. We have the budget. Yes, we right, got a budget. We passed twenty-one minutes. Oh, for God's sakes! Yes, I knew we were going to. Um, I'm keeping them as long as we can. Uh, so this is something you posted recently, and I think this is very relevant to um, what we were just talking about. One person's spam can easily be another person's favorite content on the internet. The more people join any network, the more this becomes the case. Early on, it's easy to say what is spam and what is not spam, but as the network grows, it's more murky. It's a lot more murky. Spam is not objective as one would like it to be. Um, and that to me is just like, maybe this is a great place to kind of bring us full circle back to Farcaster and sort of what you know is going on with the network there right now and sort of those adjustments that are being made and what we were talking about, you know, as we started the show, talking about Dan, um, you know, looking at, okay, here's where we we've grown, you know, an insane amount in a very short period of time. How do you start to scale for that, adjust for that, um, the sort of the growing pains of all that and sort of what how so when I go into the July channel, it's like a whole different freaking world than if you go to the DGen channel or the memes channel or the reply guys or, you know, very different feel. And it has a much more thoughtful. So for those who maybe haven't spent any time there, and if you're feeling overwhelmed by sort of the, the casino-ish aspects of crypto, go hang out in there for a while, whole different vibe. So when you think about spam for you, like what what is something that you don't want to see on your timeline and, or how are you dealing with that? And then like, what is your thinking along those, the line, if you want to expand a little bit on that um, post that, that cast that you had mentioned spam in it. Uh, like, I guess what is spam to, to me? Is, is that more? Yeah. Let's start there. Yeah. Like what, what do you not want to see um, on your timeline? I, mean, I think like, uh... like going back to that thinking. I don't, I don't think I, there's anything specific that I don't want to see. I guess, you know, maybe I, I just don't want to see the, I don't want to see just, I don't want to see the same thing over and over again. Like, I think mm. that's more spam to me. Yeah. If it's sort of different things, it's more interesting. If it's the same thing over and over, you know, if it's just a wall of just GMs, like, I don't, you know, if it's only that, it's going to feel spammy, even if it's from people that I know. So it's not some specific content that is going to bother me particularly. Um, but yeah, I also, sometimes I go in 
and I don't even um for a while I think I didn't even read the home uh hmm. feed I would just kind of like cast and sort of respond to things and and sort of just leave so I don't think I treat it in a uh, yeah I don't know what I don't know what other people do but that's the way that I use it <laughs> sometimes I don't even read through uh all the other all the other cats although I do my best to, to sort of like like ones that I see or I go into specific people's profiles and just kind of like some stuff. Yeah, it's interesting how you adjust your, you know, I, for me, I should say, I would I adjust the way I approach um, Warpcast depending on what's happening within, you know, the regular feed. If it's just a little too overwhelming, I'm like, okay, I'm just going to start with, I start with my notifications, I go through that, and then I start like yeah. digging into yeah. certain channels and see what's going on. Um, and that's sort of been the adjustment since channels became more popular, I'd say, or, or launched. Um, Adrian, I know we're, we're coming up on time. I want to make sure I leave a few minutes for your fun, usual questions. So I'm throwing yeah. it to you. All right. So July, hit him, July, we hit him with the lightning just, round. Here we go. Yeah. We just yeah. do lightning round. Don't overthink. Do it. Don't um, overthink it. But before I do, do you know what the bot or not? says about you <laughs> your account no no okay i want it's horrible and it's wrong <laughs> <laughs> it has a horrible assessment like i've been using bot or not my bot and, i'm a bot huh it's it says it's incredible and i was like so curious i'm like i bet it's going to say something like you know the biggest giga brain genius thoughtful philosopher on farcaster <laughs> and it does it and it has you as a bot or low effort caster Platitudes, awesome. hyperb hyperbole. That's so funny. That's fantastic. That's so funny. Yeah. And I not, was a like, not, <laughs> not a bot. Not a bot. Anyway. Not a bot. Um, Amazing. You ever say? All right, let's let's go. Uh, do you ever say bro IRL? <laughs> yep. Uh oh. Absolutely. <laughs> not right, a bot. That's not a bot. Yeah. Also, and I don't know if you saw this. We can talk about this on tomorrow's show, but. There's a new channel called Bromero because yeah, Dan Romero I pulled, doesn't. I pulled doesn't many like links it. for tomorrow on that. <laughs> yeah. Dan Romero thinks it's a red flag if you say bro IRL. Yeah. Um, okay. What, <laughs> what, who's like, who is the first friend you made online or what was your first kind of internet friend that you made that you've made in life? Internet friend online. Wow. My I have favorite no idea. question of hers. And I have to ask because we're on a social <laughs> network. And that's how we, so we meet our friends so online. We, we all meet on Farcaster, so I'm curious what people's first kind of yeah, maybe internet connection Facebook? was. We get a lot of yeah, cool. Yeah. Um, what's your favorite Farcaster channel? My favorite Farcaster channel right now is Storefronts. Ooh, I don't even I think I've been in that. that one. Is. I'll have to look that up. Ooh, what is your favorite? Now? <laughs> Just pictures of storefronts. That's it. Oh wow! All right, yeah. I have to go look at this. I fucking love me. I love Farcaster. I love. <laughs> I didn't even know that existed. Yeah. So um, oh, my, my favorite channel is Wooden Boats. Just, just all the oh, Wooden boats, boats is great. Yeah, it's Trains so is also great. Big fan of Trains. Shout out, you know, N sixty four Jerry. I've got to um, go follow some of new channels. Yeah. What's I your favorite holiday? My favorite holiday is probably Thanksgiving. Morning person or night owl. Um, usually a night owl, though, morning person more recently. Completionist or not? Completionist. Concert <laughs> or sporting event? Concert. Frame or cast action? Frames. Kiwi also, skin. is this, is this uh, a picture of, um, the frames hackathon. It is. Yes. Okay. So <laughs> <laughs> I'm my not background say who it is. You can't. Yeah. Yeah. But uh my brother in law is in that picture. Oh, that's funny. Oh, that's so funny. <laughs> yeah. I'm not gonna say who it is, but definitely in that picture. <laughs> Somewhere back there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, this is the variant office. The weekend frames were yeah. um the frame, the frame uh, Friday. It's frame like Friday. my favorite virtual background. 
Um, you have seven minutes with a bright, attentive seventh grader. How do you spend your time? This came from, I think it was yesterday. Doing whatever it is that they want to do. How do you find right. out what they want to do? Ask them what they're excited in, about doing. Totally right. thought you were going to make a robot. With them. <laughs> I'm kind of disappointed. I'm kind of disappointed yeah. <laughs> that you're not building a robot. What's your, all right, last two. What's your biggest fear right now? My biggest fear is probably uh, dying. Not like the fear of death but just that I'll leave a lot of things incomplete. Completionist. Yeah. I might have to end it there, but what's your favorite meme coin? My favorite meme coin is Doge. Classic. Right. I think it's classic. the origin of all meme coins. It's I have classic. a um, email wallet somewhere from 24. 13 or 2014 that I don't have access to. Oh no. Hmm. Oh, oh no. Doge. With the bunch of doge. <laughs> yeah. Oh no. Um, Thanks for that. This it. has been amazing. Thank you so much for joining us. This has been just an incredible chat. And I have to say, um, fig.eth, who's in our chat, said, slash July, the July channel is my refuge from Purple Casino. And I thought that was that was a perfect way to put that. Um, it is a nice little refuge. So if you're if you need a if you need a break from the Purple Casino, go ahead into slash July. And I, it's not just you who are who's posting very thoughtful things. As you go in there, it's mostly other folks. And it just is a whole different, whole different vibe. So thanks so much. Uh, we will be back tomorrow morning because it's only Tuesday and it feels like it's got to be Friday, but it's not. Uh, so we'll be back tomorrow, 8.30 a.m. Eastern with our regular show with Adrian. And we'll be talking all things, I don't even know, Bromero yes. and uh, such. So uh, we'll see you then. And thank you again, July. We really did. We'll see you at Farcon, I believe. So we'll see you in a yeah. few weeks, a couple weeks. Thank you so much Coming for having me in. See you IRL. See you IRL. Than we think. Yeah. Do we get yeah. to meet Rock IRL? Yeah. yeah TBD. No? TBD. All right. That'll we'll be see. interesting. He didn't Ooh. say no. He didn't say no. He didn't say no. <laughs> so maybe. All right. So awesome. You're saying there's a chance. <laughs> so you're saying there's a chance. All right. We'll see, we'll see you. We'll see you. Thanks, tomorrow. July. We'll see Thanks you so in much for having time. me. Thank you. Thank you. Bye Thanks, bye, chatters. Everybody. Thanks, chatters. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. bye.